Well, we're undertaking a review of the Epistle to the Romans, and we're in chapter 3, which will start to introduce God's solution to God's greatest problem. It's hard for us to imagine that God has a problem, but the very, His very nature compels a very unique answer to a very unique problem. That's what we're going to deal with here. Now, we're going to undertake a review of the most comprehensive treatment of doctrine in the entire Bible. When you say doctrine, that sends chills up many scholars' spine. But it is, this is the core of the whole thing. The doctrine of the entire Bible summarized here in its most comprehensive form. Some people call it the gospel according to St. Paul. I love to springboard off an insight from none other than Socrates, five centuries before Christ's birth. He's recorded as saying, it may be that deity can forgive sins, but I do not see how. And that remark demonstrates a profound insight into the real predicament that escapes many people. How can God forgive sins without violating His character? And how does a righteous God forgive sins without compromising that righteousness? And it's, it's only superficial to people who haven't looked at it carefully. The more you look at it, the more disturbing that issue becomes. Now this book, this epistle, was penned by Paul. We need to understand that Paul was very distinct from the other writers in the New Testament. Unlettered fishermen and what have you. Paul was probably one of the most profound minds that ever walked the planet Earth. He was trained in the best schools, not only of the Jewish culture, under Gamaliel himself. He really was a Pharisee of Pharisees. But he was trained in the best schools in the Greek culture. He came from a wealthy background. So he, be, he demonstrates a profound knowledge of culture on both sides, both the Jewish and Gentile communities. Jewish by background, but he also was a Roman citizen. And on several occasions that shakes the Romans, as they presumed he was Jewish and were about to scourge him, he says, can you do that to a Roman citizen? And it sent chills down the spine of those administrators. They realized it never occurred to him, them, that he had Roman citizen, which, which involved all kinds of guarantees. And he ultimately even draws upon that to go before Caesar himself. Now this book was written to whom? Don't take this for granted. It is not written to the church at Rome. There isn't a church at Rome. There are many churches. This was written to the believers, not written to unbelievers. It was intended to teach students of the Word that were already believers. They say, who founded the church at Rome? Actually, Paul did, although he never went there until later. But at Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, there were many there that had come from Rome and later go there. So many of the people in Rome that had started house churches were really derivative of Paul's teachings. So he feels a kinship there. If he didn't feel that way, he wouldn't be writing them because he would not build on somebody else's foundation. So he's writing them from the perspective that even though he, was, he didn't start those churches directly, they're his people. So he, did, he didn't feel he was stepping on somebody else's toes, if you will, by doing that. And yet he's writing to something like 28 different people that will be mentioned at the end of the, ch- uh, uh, end of the epistle. It's written to the believers in Rome individual believers, not the church as such, in the sense of an organization. That those, I, those concepts emerged several centuries later. But uh, in, the, in the early days, the church, the assembly of believers was in home. Everything in the book of Acts happened in the homes. But having said all that, let us try to understand that these believers in Rome were known throughout the world. They were turning the world upside down. And they were known throughout the world at the time. And when you realize that they didn't have uh, communication, they didn't have travel, it was all on foot. You know, it's really astonishing when you realize it, that whether you're talking about Solomon or Paul, messages were traveled on foot, by hand. You travel at the speed of horseback. And you communicated with, you know, handwritten messages. In not much over a generation, or maybe two, we travel at the speed of sound, we communicate electronically around the world. It's astonishing for us to realize that in the last century or so, 
how the world has really, really, really changed. But in any case, let's move on. There is a very key verse in the Old Testament, Habakkuk 2.4, that becomes the cornerstone of the Reformation, and that is alluded to here in not only this epistle, but three different epistles. This verse, Habakkuk 2.4, put to death the heresies that grew up in the early centuries of the church. The, church, the early church started understanding the grace of God, but within just a few centuries, it got eroded away, that by the time you get to the 5th century through the 15th century, you have that era that we call the Dark Ages, characterized by several things. The absence, the, the unavailability of the Word of God, and the absence of an understanding of God's grace. Grace erodes to legalism, and that was the cloud, the dark cloud that hung over the world for a thousand years. And what broke that cloud, the ray of light that came through, was their grasp of Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith, and that caused a reemergence of an understanding of grace. And that's what the book of Romans is all about. God's grace. And as Hal Lindsey likes to acronym it, God's riches at Christ's expense. There are three epistles in the New Testament that constitute a trilogy on this verse, the just shall live by faith. Romans 1.17 express who the just are. Who are the just? Romans, the epistle of Romans uh, deals with that. The just shall live. How shall they live? Galatians 3.11 quotes this verse and then amplifies how the just are intended to live by shedding all trappings of religious externalisms. That's another bit. And then the third of the trilogy, Hebrews, shows how they are to live by faith. Just before that hall of faith chapter, Hebrews 11, we have again Habakkuk 2.4 quoted. So interestingly enough, these three epistles form a trilogy on this verse. It's one of the many reasons we suspect that Paul did indeed pen the book of Hebrews. But in any case, the book of Romans, let's get a snapshot of the total picture. The first half of the book, eight chapters, are on doctrine. The first three chapters that we're finishing up, that, those three tonight, constitute the most complete diagnosis of sin. We use that term a lot. It's all through the Bible. What do we mean by sin? The definitive expression of what sin is is the first three chapters of the book of Romans. We'll go from there to two chapters that lay out the way of salvation. We haven't really talked about the remedy in the first three chapters. We're just defining the need. It makes no sense to deal with the, re- the remedy until you really understand what the requirement is, what the need is. And that's what we're intending to do in the first three chapters. Then we'll deal with salvation in chapters 4 and 5. And then we get to what might be for most of us the meat of the whole thing. Three chapters, 6, 7, and 8, commonly called sanctification. What does that mean? How does that differ from salvation? We'll be dealing with that. We then encounter three chapters that are dispensational. And those three chapters are hopefully will be the death knell to one of the most widespread heresies within the Christian body today. The concept that is sometimes called replacement theology. Paul will hit that head on in three chapters. Chapters 9, Israel in the past, 10, Israel in the present, 11, Israel in the future. It's commonly taught in most churches that the promises to Israel were forfeit when she rejected her Messiah, they fall upon the church, and the church has somehow replaced Israel in God's program of redemption. That sounds like just labeling or something. No, it happens to be a very deeply rooted heresy. We need to understand We need to hit it head on. We're not going to pussyfoot around on this. I've had many people come to me saying, gee, we're very uncomfortable we get into this area because so many really good people have been mistaught on this subject. The issue isn't what we believe. The issue is what Paul and the Bible says. And we're going to look at that and hit it head on. Israel, past, present, and future, chapters 9, 10, and 11. They're going to be very, very timely for us today. They're going to be very, very timely with what's going on in Washington today. And then the last few chapters, last five chapters, I'll call practical. They're a collection of personal notes to personal people that Paul appends to this letter before it gets sent off from Corinth to Rome. So that's the quick thing. And we, of course, you can look at the first eight chapters as doctrine or faith. Then the dispensational ones call that hope. It's prophetic, if you will. And then the last ones are the practical expressions of love to the other saints in person. And so we are obviously in that first group of three chapters, finishing that up. 
We talked about pagan man in Romans 1. In Romans chapter 2, we talked about more, the moral man. Those people who are unsaved but leading better lives than most Christians. What about them? And introduced in the end of that chapter, but amplified in chapter 3, is the religious man. And Paul uses as an example of the so-called religious man, the Jew. No one is more diligent. No one is more rigorously adheres to a set of rules. And yet, where does it all lead? And we're going to deal with that this evening. Let's pick up the last few verses of the last chapter by way of review. Paul says, And shall not uncircumcision, meaning the Gentiles, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by letter and circumcision dost transgress the law. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. So Paul is starting to deal with the differences between uncircumcision, the Gentiles, and the the circumcision of the Jews, pointing out that circumcision of the Jews is not enough. That's really what he's leading up to here. And this is starting to touch on this heresy that we're going to deal with as we go through the book of Romans. It's a heresy in the body of Christ that you and I need to be aware of, that God is not finished with the Jew. They have a future both individually and as a nation. The heresy is that the church has taken over the promises that were given to Israel. That's the concept that's being advanced, and that turns out to lead to serious heresies that we're going to deal with in detail, of course, in chapters 9, 10, 11, forthcoming. See, the argument is advanced that when Israel rejected her Messiah, she forfeited the promises given to her by God. The problem with that view is those promises that we're dealing with, some of the promises that we're dealing with were unconditional Israel couldn't forfeit them if they tried. And God goes to rather extreme lengths to demonstrate that, that they're unconditional. The idea, the, the, the heresy, is that these promises are now rest upon the church. This view, widely held, is sometimes called replacement theology. The church has replaced Israel. Some of it's called reconstruction theology. Some call themselves dominionists, a kingdom now, etc., and there's a book that was specifically written about this. In fact, it was written in our apartment when Ann and I lived in an apartment down at the Balboa Bay Club in Newport Beach. Hal Lindsey was in that apartment for a while and wrote a book called The Next Holocaust, which is probably one of the definitive treatments of this whole issue. Well, let's jump right into Romans 3, verse 1. Paul raises right up front then the question, What advantage then hath the Jew? And what profit is there of circumcision? He just denigrated the fact that circumcision isn't enough to get you saved. Well, if that's the case, what advantage is to the Jew? And he's going to deal with this head on. See, the pagans were condemned in chapter 1. We went through all of that in the first chapter, first session. Moral man is also condemned before God in Romans chapter 2. And now we're going to deal with the religious people that are also condemned before God. And he's going to use the most surprising example, the Jew himself, as a religious person. See, the first question pertains to Paul's words in chapter 2, 17 and 24. The second question up here. See, what advantage has the Jew? That's from the verses 17 and 24. The second question is, what profit is there of circumcision? That's the last few verses that we just read at the end of the last chapter. So Paul goes on. What advantage is the Jew? He says, much in every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. And I can tell you right now, that nine out of ten people that read that sentence don't understand what it's saying. Because the Jew, they were committed to the oracles of God. Many commentaries look at it and say, sure, because they were the custodians, they were the scribes. It was through them that we got the word of God. And that's true, but that's not what it's talking about. That's not what it's talking about. See, Paul, much in every way, or saying another way, the Jew is, it's great in every respect. Well, how so, Paul? How is it good? See, the casual reader would say the Jew had the advantage because to him was entrusted the Scriptures. That's true, but that's not what it's talking about. The word here, oracles, to them were committed the oracles of God. The word oracles is logion in the Greek. It refers to divine promises. Those divine promises were committed to them. They were not only the custodians of the text, they were the recipients of the promises. That's the concept that's there in the Greek. And some of these promises are not yet fulfilled. Are they going to be unfulfilled? God forbid. He's going to go on here. Okay? See, the Jews were not just the custodians of Scripture. I don't want to minimize that. 
Their diligence, their rigor of the scribes is breathtaking. The more you study it, the more amazed you become. And that's why when we discover the Dead Sea Scrolls and get a whole copy of the book of Isaiah that was penned a thousand years earlier, and it's, I think, three or four letters, just a few letters different from the, the copies we have today, the rigor that they preserve by their methodology is phenomenal when you realize there was no printing, no carbon paper. Everything had to be re- hand copied. But that's not what's in view here. Unto them were committed the oracles of God. What the concept in the Greek conveys is they were the recipients of the promises. They weren't just the means by which they were preserved and communicated. They were the ones that they were the beneficiaries of the promises. Big difference. There's another observation I'll throw out here I want you to be sensitive to. Do you realize there are no promises given to the church in the Old Testament? Really? Is the church visible in the Old Testament? That's a good assignment for the students. We'll figure out some way to put that on the final. Let's peek ahead in the book of Romans, chapter 16. Let's just take a look ahead. Romans 16. Paul's writing says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of the Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Whoops, whoop, whoop, what, what, what's he talking about here? The preaching of Jesus Christ according to what? The revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. This is something that wasn't in the Old Testament. But now it's made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Wow. The mystery which was kept secret since the world began. In Ephesians chapter 3, the first half of a dozen verses point out that it was Paul's unique privilege to reveal that which was hidden in the Old Testament. Ephesians chapter 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the souls of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And by the way, the other apostles concur with all this, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Notice, it's not a question of Gentiles coming to faith. They did that in the Old Testament. The fact that Gentiles would become saved is mentioned by Isaiah. That's not what he's talking about. What makes the church distinct? That Gentiles can be saved? No, it's more than that. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the gospel. That's something else again. And that's what Ephesians goes on to detail. It's now revealed. Paul's the instrument by which it's revealed. That we would be fellow heirs. That's breathtaking to anyone that understands, as Paul did, as a Pharisee of Pharisees. And of the same body. That's wild. Partakers of his promise. Be a partaker. Be a metakoi. Now, there's another thing you need to understand. There's an interval... You need to understand there's an interval between Daniel 9.25 and 9.27. 9.25 is the most phenomenal passage in the entire Bible. Verse 27 is a summary of the whole end time picture we're heading into. There's a verse between the two that is after verse 26 and before verse 27. Verse 24 in the famous 70-week prophecy lines out the whole scope. 77, 70 Shabuim are determined upon whom? not the church, upon thy people, upon the holy city, this is Jewish, to accomplish six things. Finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision of the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Now we can go through each one of these, but clearly they all haven't happened yet. So this is still incomplete. That's the main point. Verse 25 is the most breathtaking passage in the entire Bible in my view. Gabriel tells Daniel in this unusual visitation, he says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth and commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Mashiach Nagid, the Mashiach 
uh, the prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks and the street shall be built again and the wall even in troubled times. Notice it's talking about the city, not the temple, the wall, the street, etc. From the, rest- the commandment to restore Jerusalem, not the temple, unto the Mashiach Nagid, Messiah the King, technically, shall be seven plus 62, 69 weeks. From to. It's a mathematical prophecy. From this point to that point will be a particular period of time. But then after the three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. The people of the princes shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Now most of you have already studied, got a summary of this by way of review, that the trigger, the terminus a quo, the beginning of this is the commandment to destroy in Jerusalem, the final point, the terminus ad quem, is the Mashiach, the Messiah, the King. This is recorded in the book of Daniel that was translated into Greek three centuries before Christ's ministry, so it's in black and white as a matter of secular history, 300 years in advance. We know the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. We know the decree and the date. The question is when did the Messiah allow himself to be presented as a king when he rode that donkey into Jerusalem and they celebrated that very event that we call the triumphal entry? Now, Daniel's, Gabriel tells Daniel that it's 69 weeks, and we know from Sir Robert Anderson's classic work of 1894 that from Genesis to Revelation, God uses 360-day years for lots of reasons. So if you run that arithmetic, what Gabriel is telling Daniel will be 173,880 days from that decree to the presentation of the Messiah. Now, if you go through the arithmetic, it turns out that Gabriel's margin for error was a zero because the, the years are 173,740 plus the the dates in the calendar, may it March 14th to April, and then the leap years. So you run through that arithmetic in our studies, you can get, get all the background. So that's that interval. Now it's interesting, that interval shows up in Daniel 9.26. It shows up in 24 other places throughout the Bible. And I think that, happens, that fascinates me because what does the number 24 signify in the Scripture? How do you tell? You look every place is 24 and see what it's talking about. That's how you find out what 7 or 6 or 5 or 10 mean. Just look every place it appears and draw and summarize that inductively. Well, 24 only occurs two places in the Scripture. It is the priests that David organized in the 24 courses, and it's the 24 elders in Revelation, which identify themselves as the redeemed. That number seems to refer to the church. That's why it fascinates me to see that same interval 24 times in the sacred text. The church was born in a miracle in Acts chapter 2, and it will be removed in a miracle, according to 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, the harpazo. Now, I want you to understand, we don't want to go through all of this, this is just by way of a cursory review, but do understand and confirm in your own studies that Israel and the church are distinctly different. They have different origins, they have different destinies, and your challenge and something you can't do in a quick scratch pad, you could do some serious study, but go ahead and detail in your notepad all the ways that the church and Israel are different. Israel started in Exodus 4. It was born as a, They went down as a family, came out as a nation in Exodus. They have a destiny that's distinct. They inherit the land. The church was born in Acts chapter 2, and they have a destiny that's distinctive. Different origins, different destinies. Okay. Genesis 17, the covenant with Abraham. God says to him, I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and the king shall come out of thee. Really? And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for a pretty long covenant. Know what it says? I think the word everlasting is there. To be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land where therein wherein thou art a stranger, all of the land of Canaan, for an everlasting, there it is again, possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you, and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and he shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Okay. Now, there are three ways to become a seed of Abraham. Did you know that? Three ways. You can be a physical seed. Check your DNA. Maybe you're Jewish. Some of the promises 
are to those descendants, even if they're unbelievers. Some of the promises that you'll find affect if you're a physical seed of Abraham, period. You can proselyte and become a proselyte into the Jewish community. That's what they did. Many did. Who built the synagogue in Capernaum? Centurion. That's interesting. Believers can get spiritual benefits by doing that. The other way, as Gentiles, by union with Christ, because Christ was Jewish. You haven't noticed, okay? We need to understand that. Jeremiah 31, Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun of, for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is His name. Do we know who He's talking about? Let's see what He says. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord. What ordinances? The sun, the moon, and all that, right? Then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Whoops. Hmm. Thus saith the Lord, if the heaven above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. This is a very dangerous kind of rhetoric because you're arguing from a contrary fact presumption. So don't misunderstand what he's saying. If white can be black and black can be white, then Israel will end. That's sort of a way of getting across the same concept. See, the world would have to disintegrate before Israel would be cast off. I'm going to hear it already. People write me letters. Isn't the world, isn't the world going to disintegrate? Yeah, but that's a whole other thing. Okay. Now, the Reconstructionists or the replacement theologians are impugning the integrity of God. Now some people get really upset, you know, because there are a lot of groups around that have slightly, they have views about the Scripture that are different from ours. And we get, you know, I love what my wife has hanging in her ministry, in the hall of her ministry. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, agape. Now there are many good scholars that have different views about different aspects. And because of our desire to be as tolerant as possible, I've been often admonished by people on our staff, hey, go softly on this issue. I have to tell you I can't. Because this issue is a little different than some others because by adhering to this issue, you're calling God a liar. Anyone that hears this is having to do some real twisting with Old Testament and New Testament passages. Because God is very, he's, he's gone to such extremes to be clear and unequivocal on his relationship with Israel in the future. And for us to deny that future is calling God a liar. We may not like that term, I'm saying it deliberately that strongly. It was this view, this reconstruction or replacement theological view that led to the anti Semitism in Europe that in turn led to the Holocaust. And why is this so important? Because it's happening again. The same nonsense is being promoted among Christians. And that's laying the, bed, the seedbed for the anti-Semitism that's going to result in a Holocaust twice as bad that's coming. The first Holocaust took one Jew and three on the planet Earth. According to Zechariah 13, verses 8 and 9, the next one will take two out of three. It'll be a time of trouble such as the world had never seen before. That's Jesus' words, quoting from Daniel 12. Man, they've had some pretty serious trouble in the past. You mean it's going to get worse? Yes. Let's look at, look at Ezekiel 37. Everybody knows about the dry bones of vision and all that. Ezekiel says, Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones, speaking of the valley of dry bones and all that, are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land, and then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Wow. When Jesus rode that donkey into Jerusalem, we just talked about it in Daniel 9, in Luke 19 they record the triumphal entry, and he rides this donkey up over the hill from Bethany, and he sees Jerusalem. And in verse 41, like Luke 19, when he was come near, he beheld the city and he what? He wept over it, saying, 
If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace. In other words, he held him accountable for that very day, and he makes it clear he's holding him accountable that day. But then he says a statement that many people miss. But now they are hid from thine eyes. Wow, what does that mean? Jesus, creator of the universe, announces they didn't recognize the day that was appointed, that was foretold to the very day. Because they didn't recognize it, they had their chance. Now these things are hidden from your eyes. Israel is blinded. Are they blinded forever? No, because we're going to read when we get to Romans 11. Paul says, I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. Ooh. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until, and I love that word until, the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Israel's national blindness is not permanent. It's until what? The fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Well, what's the fullness of the Gentiles? That's the gathering of the church. Not the times of the Gentiles. That's Gentile dominion from Nebuchadnezzar to the Antichrist. The fullness of the Gentiles is the gathering of the church. Until the fullness of Gentiles be what? Come in. Then national blindness will be lifted. That's what the tribulation is all about. And where do, the, where do the Gentiles have to come in to? I wouldn't build doctrine on this, but I suspect he's talking about the Harpazo. Who gathers them and brings them in. And that triggers a lot of other things. Romans 11 continues, And so all Israel shall be saved, as written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and he shall turn away the ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins, and concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for your father's, of the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. They're given, once given, they're given. That's interesting. They're enemies for your sakes. By them being enemies, it opens the door to the church. So Paul continued getting back to Romans chapter 3. We're down to the third verse. We're doing great here. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? He's obviously being, you know, absurd, you see. Some of Israel did not believe. Nothing changed. So what if they did? God's faithfulness is the issue, not our faithfulness. Praise God. Shall their unbelief nullify the faithfulness of God? Of course not. It is the faithful of God which is the issue, not Israel's unfaithfulness. We bank on God's faithfulness. We're not banking on Israel's faithfulness or unfaithfulness. And just to underscore how Paul is deliberately being absurd here, he says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest be overcome when thou art judged. What he says in the Greek is, make kenito, let it not be so. Or translated, God forbid. In other words, he said something that intentionally was so absurd you'd get it, but to make sure you didn't miss it, God forbid. Let God be true, but every man a liar, and so on. If you don't believe the promises that God has given the Jew, then you're calling God a liar is what he's saying. He's saying that right here. I can't escape it. Paul is calling the Reconstructionists, the replacement theologians, liars. Not intentionally, not maliciously, but they are unbelief, disobedience, and lying. Calling God a liar are the same thing. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. John is saying the same thing. Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. The concepts of unbelief, disobedience, and calling God a liar are equivalent. Can't escape it. That's what makes unbelief such a disaster. It isn't honest skepticism. It's when you call him a liar that we've got a problem. Unbelief is simply not accepting God's Word. Psalm 51, let's take a look at David. Have mercy on me, O God, according to the loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. In other words, he acknowledged him, first of all. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgressions. That's a key point. I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, the only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Wow. David confessed his sin, acknowledged his ownership, his guilt of it, and repented. That's a key word. 1 John 1, 9. 
Let's remember it. If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It's His faithfulness that's key here. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To forgive our sins and cleanse us. Praise God. That's the Christian's bar of soap. 1 John 1, 9. Repentance is essential to the Jew as well as every one of us. And that's all through the Scripture. We don't have to beat that to death. Zechariah 12. It shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David. Oh, really? And upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for them as one mourneth for his only son. And they shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for the firstborn. And for 1900 years, Judaism has tried to twist this verse so it doesn't read like this, except Rabbi Yitzhak Kaduri, the most venerated rabbi in the ultra-Orthodox, 200,000 people came to his funeral a year ago. He had a message sealed until one year after his death, which has just been opened up. And among other things, he indicates that this verse is messianic. Isaiah 53 is messianic. The two messiahs, Mashiach ben David, Mashiach ben Yosef, are the same one. Uh, All these classic divisions between Christianity and Judaism, he erased and has really shook up, unsettled the ultra-Orthodox community. Continuing this passage here, in that day shall there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem in the morning of Hedron and the valley of Megiddo, and the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan. That's interesting. You got David and Nathan. That's the line through Mary, not Le- Joseph the Levi side, uh, and their wives apart. Family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart. The family of Shimei apart, their wives apart. The families that remain, every family apart, their wives apart. In that day there shall be a fountain opened up to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Oh boy. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is bitterness for the firstborn. This phrase in Zechariah 12, 10, and they shall look up me, upon me whom they have pierced. If you look at the Hebrew you'll discover that there's a, two letters that are not translated. An aleph and a tau. Now when the aleph and tau are connected, they can be used. There's four different uses for it, one of which is to indicate the direct object of a verb, but then there's usually a makef connecting them. This is not that. This is one of the other four uses of it. Let me say it. If I said it in the Greek, they should look up on me, the alpha and the omega, whom they pierced. The aleph and the tau are the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. They don't translate it that way but one can defend that approach. Anyway, Hosea 5.15, God says, I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. He's talking about Israel. He says, I will return to my place. That means he must have left it. How long will I leave? Till they acknowledge their offense and, and seek my face. In their affliction they shall seek me earnestly. And that's, of course, what the purpose of the tribulation is about. And we'll be dealing with that later. In this. Let's go back to We're in verse 5. We're making progress here. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. He's again arguing elliptically. What's implied by the way he's saying this is we did God a favor by being so rebellious. Is God going to judge us for glorifying Him? That's a kind of logic that's absurd, of course. The way he's phrased it in the Greek, it demands a negative answer. And we're going to deal with this whole issue when we get to chapter 6, so I don't want to beat it up here. But just to make sure you understand what Paul is saying, God forbid... For then how shall God judge the world? See, the rabbis knew that the Gentiles were to be judged, so Paul is using an ellipsis on their own convictions. The Jew knew the Gentiles were going to be judged, but he's pointing out that by the same judgment the Jews also fail. That's what he's really building up here. For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? That's the, the peculiar argument here. And not rather, as we have slanderously reported, as some affirm that we say, let us do evil, that good may come, whose damnation is just. These are ellipses that he's using to confirm his message. Salvation is by grace, not by works. That's really what he's building up to here. Salvation cannot be lost through works. It is secure eternally. See, if you can't be saved by works, you're not going to be lost by works. Because it's not the works, it's not either one that saves you, It's a 100% job that Christ has done. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. You cannot add to what Christ has completed on the cross. 
That doesn't mean you shouldn't do works. The point is, if you're doing the works to be saved, you're taking the position that Christ's work is incomplete. His complete work saved you if you accept it. Works is a whole other subject we'll deal with later. So what keeps you from sinning? Your trying to avoid sin isn't what saves you. Christ saves you. Then, okay, all right. Why? What keeps me from sinning then? Hopefully a grateful heart. When you begin to understand what it cost him, you should overflow with love for your Savior. That's what motivates you. That itself isn't enough to keep you pure, but it's what you are expected in response to what he has done. Paul says, what then? Are we better than they? Speaking of the Jews, we as, we as Jewish, they as Gentile. He's speaking to the Jews here. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no way. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. They're all under sin. That's his final conclusion we're going to get to here shortly. See, we are the Jews, they are the Gentiles. All are guilty. Pagan man was at creation. That was chapter 1. Moral man was also guilty. Chapter 2, last half. He doesn't even live up to his own conscience, which is inadequate. The religious man, the Jew. That's the greatest historical illustration of commitment sincerity that you can find in history, and yet it doesn't make it. The Jews, with all their sincerity and commitment, cannot save themselves. That's his point. Remember Jesus said that in Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount. Unless your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall otherwise enter the kingdom of God. What a bow for the Jew. Because those were the professional law keepers, and they couldn't cut it. Man, that's the key point. The case against the entire human race is 14 distinct counts. We'll go through them very quickly. The first few deal with man's character, which is hopelessly flawed. We have a genetic deficiency. It's called SIN, we're SIN positive. Verses 13 and 17 are man's conduct, his speech, and his actions. And finally, the cause of all of this. As it's written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. This is Romans 3.10. All are willfully ignorant. We nailed this in chapter 1. If none seeks, then all that seek do so upon God's initiative. In other words, if none seek God on their own, those that are seeking God are responding to God's initiative. That's his point. And that gets into election. Okay? In Luke chapter 4, you may recall, when he's in Nazareth, at the end, near the end of that chapter, he says to them, I tell you the truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Sarepah, the city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. Lots of widows, only one to one he was sent. Okay, lots of widows around, just the one. He said that many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisus, the his successor, the prophet. And none of them was cleansed except, they're saving, Naaman the Syrian. Head of the Syrian army. It was in the Jordan and all that, you remember. Now, any time you and I, he gives something in the Scripture, you and I might miss, the Pharisees come to a rescue. They get so upset with what he just said, they tried to throw him off a cliff. Why are they upset? What's wrong with the fact that he saved only one widow and only one leper? Because he chose two examples both of which were Gentiles. And there he's talking to a Jewish audience. They were incensed. What he's communicating is the doctrine of election. God will have mercy on whom he have mercy. All they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of a hill whereupon the city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. Wow. And Jesus answered... They're changing, going out to John, we're moving to John 6. Jesus answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves, no man can come unto me, except the Father which hath sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Every one of you that's come to God has come at his initiative, not yours. It is written in the prophets, And they shall be all taught of God, every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God hath seen the Father. Verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Has. Not will get. Hath everlasting life. We're going to explore this whole thing further when we get to Romans 8 in an unparalleled tour de force in the Scripture. Romans 8. If you get a little slow anywhere through here, it seems a little rough. Hang in there. Our goal is Romans 8. But we're down to verse 12 in chapter 3. 
They're all gone out of the way. They come together, become, they have all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. They deliberately turn their backs on the truth. They dishonored God instead of glorifying Him. What use are they? They're unprofitable. The term there implies like fruit that's overripe. It's not good for anything anymore. It's spoiled. They do not follow after that which is good. Man does not evolve upwards despite the way we've tried to organize our entire culture. That's a lie. They don't, man does not evolve upwards. He devolves downward. And if you think the schools are destroying our culture, you're absolutely right. That's their design. That's their deliberate intent. And I hope you don't believe that. I hope you check it out. Read Barrett Chose's uh, Brave New Schools or dozens of books written on the deliberate plan to dumb down the workforce to be a manageable electorate. My wife and I are totally flabbergasted on those few occasions when we watch television at the inanity of the commercials. They are stupid. And you wonder, who are they designed for? The public. (laughs) Madison Avenue knows what they're doing. They're not stupid. And they're designing those for the mentality of the culture. Go back and read the Federalist Papers during the Revolution. These were pamphlets handed out on street corners, and today they're graduate school material. Moving on, verse 13, their throat is an open sepulcher. Ooh, that's graphic. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Boy, that's graphic. That's graphic. He's quoting Psalm 5.9. An asp, of course, was the Egyptian cobra that we know of. It goes on, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. You know, it's annoying just to be in public, in public transportation, in an airplane or whatever, to listen to the language of average people, not just a few weirdos. The average person is such foul language that it's just astonishingly offensive. Man's tongue is a window into his heart. And you can go through a lot of scriptures on that, Mark 7, Matthew 12, elsewhere. And we're going to get to Romans 10, that with thy mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then it goes on, it goes, you know, notice by the way how it's going anatomically, you know, from the heart, the mouth, finally to the, to the feet. The feet are swift to do what? Shed blood. According to Isaiah 15, all these are quotes from the Old Testament. Destruction and misery are in their ways. See, man has no real fulfillment except in glorifying God. It's astonishing how often we, in a, in a biography or in a, in some of our entertainment, we see a life, someone's life, and you see them come to the end of their life and you realize it was in futility. What did they really accomplish? Not here to disparage them, but nothing if they're not glorifying God. That's the long and the short of it. And the way of peace have they not known. There's no peace if you're separated from God. Ephesians 6.15 There is no fear of God before their eyes. Where do you get the fear of God? You'll learn about God from the Scriptures, but where do you get the fear of God? Answer? Important surprise. In your devotional life. The study the Word of God to learn about God and to fall in love with Him. The devotion is what you get the real awe and reverence of God. He's quoting Psalm 36 here. And it's similar to the days of Noah. All f- the way of, end of all flesh has become before me. See, even in Noah's day, Noah found grace and he and his family. Everybody else was wiped out. That's graphic. That gets it across. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. And there's lots of verses on this. We don't have to hammer it. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, get this now, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. You know, a lot of Christians get very enamored with the Messianic movement. And it is very important for Christians to understand the Old Testament. There's a great value in embracing and understanding and even celebrating, in a, in a way, the uh, Mosaic feasts, Passover and all this. Learn them, study them, understand them. It's an incredible blessing. The danger is, as you get into those kinds of groups, to start trying to fulfill the law. Well, you've got to keep the Torah. No, 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 no. Remember Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. That doesn't mean you shouldn't celebrate those things. That doesn't mean you don't try to keep Shabbat if you feel led to. But you don't keep Shabbat to be saved. By the deeds of the law, 
There shall, and, but, and Shabbat, of course, was ordained long before the law. But the point is, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. This is the beginning of the answer. From verse 20 to 21 is the big watershed. We're going to shift from this dark, heavy guilt trip, if I can put it that way, to Paul's going to give us, begin to give us a glimpse of the remedy. He's acknowledging the reality. First of all, it's the law. To show us what sin is, Okay, that's what the law does. It shows us what sin is. I remember that Walter Martin, once before a denominational group, he was being, he, he loved to use the, the law as like a shaving mirror. It shows us our sin. But it doesn't shave us. We're shaved by grace. <laughs> <laughs> Typical Walter. Anyway, the second purpose of the law may shock you. It's to drive us to sin more. You've got to be kidding, Chuck. You can't mean that. We're going to explore that when we get to Romans 5, verse 20 and 21. But it's also to drive us to our knees, to show us who we are and to drive us to our knees. And the the answer, of course, as you probably have guessed, but he hasn't built it yet, I'm just glimming ahead, is faith in Christ alone. Not the law, faith in Christ alone. He continues, verse 21, but now... The righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. See, but now, this links, you're coming to the key conclusion he's leading up to here. The gospel is presented as the only remedy, something the law can't do. The righteousness of God is the primary theme of the epistle to Romans. Jeremiah 23, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is in his name whereby he shall be called. Yodhevave Tzidkanu. The Lord our righteousness. Tzidkanu. <laughs> Jehovah Tzidkanu. Psalm 143. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness answer me in, my, in thy righteousness. And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. See, Luther noted, it's on the basis of God's righteousness, not ours, that it's all going to be settled. Anytime we try to be righteous, we're denying God's righteousness. The only righteousness that counts is one that is given to us, not one that we earn. Psalm 32, this is the one, Luther quotes this psalm and calls it, he calls Psalm 32 one of the Pauline psalms. Luther calls it that. And he, we're going to talk about it. He's going to quote this in chapter 4. I'm getting ahead of it a little bit. But blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Luther recognized in these Psalms, the echoing in advance, what Paul was driving home in his epistles. Isaiah 53, 11, And he shall see the travel of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall the right, my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. The whole chapter 53 of Isaiah was ratified by Rabbi Yitzhak Kaduri as referring to the Messiah, despite what Judaism tried to teach for so many centuries. It's the cross that justifies. Religion doesn't work. What is religion? Man's attempt to reconcile himself for God. It's Jesus Christ is the most anti-religious person that ever walked the face of the earth. This all started in Genesis 3.21. When they tried to cover them, Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves with aprons and fig leaves, and God covered them with coats of skins, teaching them, in effect, that by the shedding of innocent blood they'd be covered. And David said in Psalm 51, Deliver me in thy righteousness. In David's psalm of repentance, Deliver me in thy, not mine, thy righteousness. Well, get down to verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all, them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no difference. Pagan, moral, Jew, Gentile, all have sinned. That's the whole thrust of the first three chapters of the book of Romans, is to lay down without equivocation the requirement that everyone, without exception, needs a Savior, God Himself. Man, no matter how perfect he manages to be, it ain't perfect enough. That's the point. Striving ain't going to do it. Accepting Jesus Christ has already accomplished it. The pagan, the moral man, the religious man of all fallen. They all, and falling keeps falling. It's 
it's present tense. It's continuing. Short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There are four critical words here. Justified, being justified. What do you mean justified? Being declared legally without guilt. That's what justification means. You can be justified, you're still not sanctified. Justified means you're declared innocent. Declared legally without guilt. Righteousness, righteous is not a process, it's all at once. You're clean completely by God's declaration, justification. Being justified freely by His grace. The word freely there in the Greek is durian, which means a gift without reason. It's not a gift you've earned. It's a gift given to you for no cause on your part. That's the, what the word implies. Okay. Freely by His grace. What's grace? Unmerited favor. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is the opposite of that. It's not getting what you do deserve. Okay. Being justified freely by His grace. How? Through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The word redemption means to be set free typically from a slave market, by a ransom being paid. You were purchased. Someone's paid something you had no hope of ever paying. Taken care of for you. We're justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. Ooh, there's a $10 word, huh? Set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Propitiation. What is propitiation? Hmm? That's a tough word, isn't it? Big word. It's the greatest love word in the Scripture. It's built from the Greek word helisterion, the lid of expiation, which in turn comes its derivative from the Hebrew kapareth, which means the mercy seat. It's the word for propitiation. What do you mean by expiation? That's simply atoning or suffering, suffering punishment, for some wrongdoing, something done, or something given uh, to make amends for the wrongdoing. This propitiation has been taken care of for us. How? Through the blood of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins past, uh, that are passed through the forbearance of God. And there's a whole business of the mercy seat and the capereth and all that we can, we'll get into later. Here's God's greatest problem. It derives from His seven attributes. And I invite you to do your own study of the seven attributes. He's obviously a sovereign. He's accountable only to himself. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He can't learn. He can't be disappointed in you because he knows in advance when you're going to blow it. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful, visible and invisible. He's omnipresent. And we're beginning to grasp that through particle physics because particles that get divided have no locality. They're everywhere all at once. And we begin to realize that we're living in a simulation. And that's even commonly talked about in the advanced physics papers these days. He's obviously loved. That's no surprise to most of you. He's immutable. He's unchanging. That's why we can claim Second Chronicles 7.14 on behalf of the United States. People argue with me about that. I say it's a principle that God's immutable. He declares a principle there. And of course he's just. And that's the problem. He's both just and sovereign. That links them together. That's his problem. He can't just forgive out of leniency. That violates his character. He has the standard of his own character, absolute righteousness. So the sins that you've committed have to be paid for. And nothing short of the death of God himself will avail. God had become a man and fulfilled the law on our behalf in our stead. That's the whole thing that we're getting into here. So that's the problem we're dealing with. How can, how to be just and yet justify sinful man? How can he just, see Socrates at least grasped the problem. Most people today don't understand the solution because they don't understand the question in the first place. Verse 26, do declare, Paul says, I say at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Jesus paid it all so now he has a basis to justify all of us. That he might be just. The most important purpose clause around. This is God's greatest problem. That he might be just and yet be the justifier of him. Jesus is obviously the solution. Paul is going to be, he's setting the groundwork to present as you go forward. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what? Law of works? (laughs) Nay. But by the law of faith. By the law of faith. 
Faith is taking God at His word. Not taking God at His word is calling Him a liar. It's impugning His integrity. Therefore, Paul says, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Oh, if our Messianic friends could just understand this. In all their enthusiasm, and all their commitment, they are putting themselves under the Torah and they miss the point. Not that it isn't worth keeping, that's not the point. But it's trying to, to justify yourself by deeds of the law. Abraham was reckoned to righteousness by faith when he was still on Gentile ground, by the way. He was saved in Genesis 15, verse 6. Circumcision was not instituted until Genesis 17. Interesting. Abraham was saved before the circumcision. He was saved long before the law was given to Moses. Two chapters before the covenant of the sign of the circumcision was placed on his flesh. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. That's his point. He's really wrapped up under one umbrella, Jews and Gentiles, because he's going forward. Habakkuk 2.4 Do we make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. That's the purpose it was given, to show us what sin is, to drive us to sin more, to drive us to our knees. That's the purpose of the law, and we're going to develop that when we get to chapter 5. Faith in Christ alone is the answer. Okay, we have been through the tough part of this book. These first three chapters are the comprehensive diagnosis of sin. We could have easily spent a year on it. Each one of these verses is a springboard to a whole study theologically. We've tried... In other words, it could have been worse, gang. (laughs) (laughs) Now we move to chapters 4 and 5, and we have the solution. You won't appreciate the solution until you understand the problem. Now we're ready for chapters 4 and 5. So in the next session, I want you to read Romans chapter 4. I want Abraham and David speak about God's greatest gift. And I want to ask you, how was Abraham saved? How was David saved? They're different. Is Paul's doctrine contradicted by the epistle of James? Many people think so. We'll try to hit that head on. Paul did. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for this awesome revelation that we all have a desperate need for you. That we're in a predicament that we can do nothing to avail ourselves of that nothing less than the death of God was required to get us out of the mess we're in. And we thank you, Father, that you sent your Son, our Creator, to become a man in our stead and to fulfill the specifications to be a propitiation for us. That through His shed blood, you would have a basis to have us reconciled to you. Not by us, but by the blood of our Savior. Oh, Father, we apprehend just enough of all of this to realize it's far beyond our ken. We just thank you that you've gone to such extremes, Father. Such extremes that we might live. How you, Father, must have loved us so much as to endure your Son to be spit upon, to be tortured, to go through 30 years of identity as illegitimate so that we could have clear title to be a son of yours, Father. Oh, Father, we just pray that through your Holy Spirit you would reignite in each of us a new passion for these things. That you'd help us understand what you've done for us. And that we might avail ourselves of the resources you've placed with us and in us, in your Holy Spirit. That we would not only grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, but that we might become more effective stewards of the opportunities you've placed before us. We thank you, Father, for who you are. And we thank you for the gift of the propitiation available to us in Jesus Christ as we commit ourselves without any reservations whatsoever 
into your hands. Indeed, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.